Welcome all. I'm James Bennett, the second arts and culture reporter for GBH News, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this month's Beyond the Page and onto the stage. This is Life of Pi. In a few minutes, we will be joined by Lolita Chakrabarti and Max Webster, theatrical adapter and director of Life of Pi. What began as the epic novel by Jan Martel and was then transformed to an Oscar-winning film has now been brought to the stage and is making its North American debut at Cambridge's own American Repertory Theater this December. Life of Pi follows a story of 16-year-old Pi after a ship he and his family are traveling on sinks in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, leaving Pi stranded on a lifeboat with just four other survivors, a hyena, a zebra, an orangutan, and a royal Bengal tiger. The production has been called extraordinary and unmissable. From its nautical setting to its inventive puppetry, this epic story of hope and endurance is being brought to life in a highly imaginatively theatrical way. And tonight, you will all get the chance to hear about the inspiration, creative vision, and talent behind that magic. Lolita Chakrabarti is an award-winning playwright and actress. Her first play, Red Velvet, earned her a number of awards, including the Evening Standard Charles Wintour Award for Most Promising Playwright in 2012. Additional writing credits include him and an adaptation of Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities, among others. She adapted the classic novel, Life of Pi, which opened in London's West End in December 2021 after premiering to five-star reviews at the Shuffled Crucible Theater in July 2019. It received five Olivier Awards in 2022, including Best Play. Max Webster is an award-winning theater director specializing in new work, opera, and live music events. Max has been known for his eclecticism and wide-ranging imagination, which he's brought to production by those ranging from Shakespeare to Dr. Seuss. He is an associate director at the Donmar Warehouse, where he recently directed Kit Harington from Game of Thrones in Henry V. Now, before I welcome Lita and Max on screen, I want to explain how this evening's event will work. We are using Zoom webinar, and as our audience, we cannot see or hear you, but we do want to hear from you. You can ask questions during the course of the conversation by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. You can put your questions in at any point in time during our conversation this evening. And we'll do our best to address as many of those questions as we can throughout the night. See a question that you want to hear the answer to? Well, you can vote for it by clicking the thumbs up icon in that Q&A tab. And the most popular questions will rise to the top of the list. To activate Zoom's automated captioning feature, select the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. Then select the live transcript option and two transcription display options will pop up. And we recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript and a sidebar window will open where you can see what each speaker is saying. Now, please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. And now that housekeeping is done, it is my pleasure to introduce Melita Chakrabarti and Max Webster. Hi, James. Hi. Where are you all right now? I know you are in, are in the UK. Max, where are you from right now? Hi, I'm in Boston. You've just oh, been... okay, great. So we're very much awake. Melita, you seem very awake too. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to a, a very good conversation. We've all had our evening coffee and tea, it seems. Now, um, let's just start with uh, some broad strokes. Can I ask you two to talk about how you took this novel that was published in 2001 and then turned into a film by Ang Lee that premiered in 2012. And now, almost a decade later, you've you know taken that and you've transformed it for the stage. What was that process like? Wow, that's that's that makes it sound like we did the film, we wrote the novel. Yeah, Max, let's take a credit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you should start. Uh, you started, Alita. You should start. Okay, I'll start it. Um, so I uh, I was approached to adapt the novel. Uh, uh, I can't remember how long ago, maybe five years ago, uh, and I'd loved the book when I read it uh, when it came out, and so leapt at it. Um, and I I'm quite sort of particular when I write. I like to um, do a first draft on my own 
with no other uh, creatives attached because I just need to hear my own voice. I need to know what the story is and how I'm going to interpret it. So I did a sort of, well, I did a first draft um, and then we found the wonderful Max to come and, uh, and, and make it better. So then what did we do? We did workshops, didn't we? We did workshops. I don't know if it was better. I think we were both searching together, weren't we? <laughs> I guess there's, um, uh, Jan's novel is huge and complicated. And one of the excitements was it contains things that are sort of impossible to put on the stage, like tigers and oceans and theology and things that, you know, any sensible team wouldn't go anywhere near. So I guess we were really slowly trying to work out how we could do things, like how would we put a tiger on stage? And so Lolita and I would sit together and we'd go, what happens if the tiger is someone in an office slowly transforming into a tiger? What would happen if the tiger is someone in a onesie? What would happen if the tiger is a beautiful mask? What would, and then eventually, what would happen if the tiger was a three-person puppet operated by highly skilled puppeteers? And I think weird lead decisions seem obvious in retrospect. It seems obvious that this is a puppetry show, but for a while it wasn't. And we tried lots of different things, didn't we? And we worked out what made your writing come alive and we worked out what gaps there were in the story that needed telling visually and what was better told through language and what was better told through movement. And that was sort of challenge by challenge and scene by scene. And it was long and slow and kind of messy, but really collaborative and joyful, I thought. Yeah, it was, a, it was I, I guess at the center of it was always story, wasn't it? It was always story, whether it was puppets or it was set or it was scenes, uh, relationship, it was always, how do we move the story on from this point to that point where a boy is happy in India, a boy goes to sea, everything goes wrong and then he survives. How do we tell that story um, and, and, and fill it with logic and joy as well? Yeah. yeah, so I wanted to ask you, what is your relationship to the book itself? Had you read it before um, you all began work on this production? Did you pick up the book once this became, you know, a viable creative project? What, what's that like? So I read the book in 2002 when it came out. Um, I was part of a book club and I, I got the book and, uh, and I loved it. And I couldn't, could I, I could tell you now why I loved it, but at the time I didn't know. It, was, it has this mysterious quality to it where it makes complete sense and then it makes no sense at all. And it makes it widens your mind, and um, and it made me think of things in a different way. And it didn't give me an answer, and I loved that. It didn't give me an answer at the end of the book, where I thought, "Aha, I know what happened." Uh, and it, but it also didn't leave me hanging either. It gave me a, a, a sort of tantalising taste, and um, and that feeling stayed with me. Uh, it's a total testament to Jan Martel's writing. So that's my relationship to the book. Max, what about you? Have you had any relationship with the book before you started working on this? Yes, I had a funny experience where I'd read it and loved it and thought it was very beautiful. And like Lisa had enjoyed it and didn't quite know why I'd loved it, but had like so many readers of that novel, had an emotional experience reading it and thought the sort of central image of a boy and a tiger in a lifeboat was somehow kind of really imprinted on me. And I said to various theatres, this would be an amazing thing to do. And various theatres said, well, I'm afraid you can't do it because someone's already optioned the rights. And then amazingly, it circled back round. So that was a real blessing. Yeah. Um, well, you just mentioned in your answer this feeling of ambiguity while you're reading the book back in 2002. Um, now you're working as a playwright, you've adapted that book for stage. I want to come back to that idea of ambiguity, right? It's like, you've been working on this work for stage. And maybe I'm making an assumption, but is it sometimes, is it true that as a creator, you're hoping you can get the spirit of the um, the original work right in your adaptation? Like, I feel with this ambiguity, there's a lot of different ways to kind of read what's going on. I guess what I want to ask is, how are you carrying the confidence that, you know, your adaptation is is faithful to an ambiguous work. Uh, it's interesting when you say um, to get it right, because that is the, uh, the, <clears throat> the uh, I'm chasing this carrot constantly to get it right. I don't think there is a right. I think every writer would tell it differently. 
Um, and I think that uh, it's your interpretation, that's all it is. So this version is my interpretation of the book. Um, but in terms of keeping the essence of the original novel, that's my job. I feel very responsible to the author. Well, I've adapted a few things now and um, I feel very, um, like I have to take them with me and, and take them with care because it's a huge trust. You know, these people have written these, these amazing pieces of work um, and then trustingly hand it over to another artist to sort of pull it apart. We did this um, a Q and A, Max, myself and Jan Martel in Sheffield. And Jan was um, hilarious actually, because somebody said to him, what was it like, uh, you know, uh, giving these two artists your, your novel to adapt? And he said, well, he said, you know, when you've got a baby and you're holding this baby lovingly, and then you hand it over to somebody else, and then they sort of pull the arms off it and the legs off it and they move its head and they stick it in different places. He said, it's a bit like that. <laughs> I thought, wow, I mean, it made us all laugh, but I thought, yeah, I can totally understand that because you're allowing somebody else to interpret what you meant. So that ambiguity at the heart of his book, um, I'm hoping that we have managed to translate that, that keeps the, the magic of it and doesn't leave you thinking what happened, but leaves you thinking, oh, was it this or was it that? It, it's an active forward motion rather than a doubt. <laughs> I want to ask another question about adaptation um, for or for the both of you before we get into some of the more um, tactile elements uh, of this production. That is puppets. Um, so between book, between stage, there was a film, and uh, have both of you seen that seen that film by Lee? Has did that factor in at all to the visual representation of what is going on into the stage, or did you find yourself having to divorce yourself? From, from that to create your own and realize your own vision. Max. I think uh, you just can't do it in the same way on stage. So on the film, the film's got amazing visuals. The CGI is beautiful. The tiger's astonishing. The animals are brilliant. Um, but there's just no way you can recreate that on stage. And some people might think that's a problem. I actually think that's an advantage because in, on stage, you have to ask the audience to imagine along with you. So what they could achieve in the film, which was extraordinary, was a totally realistic image of a boy on a lifeboat with a tiger. And you just can't do that in theatre. What you have to do is something that's a much more open or poetic or a representation of holes in. And the holes are really important because that's a hole where you ask the audience to go, uh, that, can you fill that hole with your imagination? And so that's what a puppet does really, because you know we all know the puppet's a piece of wood and some string painted orange and black. Uh, whereas that tiger on the film looks absolutely like a real tiger. So we don't, in a way we don't have to complete the image on the film, but with on the stage show, because there are gaps in the representation, the audience's complicity and active imaginative engagement is kind of demanded, like in a game, like when you play with a child. And I think that's really liberating because it means the images don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be 100% complete. And I actually think that asks for a deeper imaginative engagement. And I hope uh, if I was being proud, I would say that the play is more moving than the film for a lot of people. Uh, it's not quite as realistic because it's a play, but that I hope we can get a kind of deeper level of emotional engagement. And I think, I think that comes through asking for the audience's imagination to play along with us. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about um, about the puppetry aspect of this of this uh, show. I mean, you know, there's a rich tradition of, of puppetry. It's a very um, amazing uh, form of, of craft and of art in and of itself. Can you? I mean, we don't have enough time. I feel to go through the process of, a process of what it was like creating it. But can you take me to the moment where you saw? The, the the puppet in its final form and you thought aha that's it what was what was that moment like i don't know the final form of the puppet arrived kind of a couple of days before our opening night in sheffield <laughs> it was endlessly being remade and repainted i think these things i don't know there was never an aha moment i think in a very early workshop we did a scene where Pi tries to tame the tiger and we found that even with a really basic prototype tiger made out of 
uh, wood and some plasters out and nothing fancy at all, uh, that the story could really come alive. I think that was quite an aha moment when it felt like the tiger could be a real character and could, could be threatening, could be dangerous, could be exciting, could feel really live. And that even if it wasn't a kind of finished image, we could uh, believe in the story. I think that was quite amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so with regards to the to the puppetry, for, this is for you, Louita. Um, as you're writing out uh, this adaptation with, you know, words, how are you, how are you writing for the, for the puppet? Are you writing for the puppet? Yeah, absolutely writing for the puppet. I mean, I, the first draft that I did of this play had as, had as many um, of the gems of the novel as I could cram in because there's so much there. And uh, I remember in one of the workshops, Max with these actors who had come in to sort of improvise and work around what I had done, um, you know, did all these animals. I had flocks of birds and uh, rhinoceros and, and huge amounts of like a whole zoo um, are in, in the script. And uh, they all acted it out um, with, with cardboard boxes, with uh, coat hangers, you know, they just, whatever they could grab hold of, they made them be penguins and meerkats and it kind of worked actually. It is amazing that way. Um, and I and I realized, A, there were too many animals uh, and, and we'd never be able to afford the show because each puppet is pretty expensive, but also that animals need space and they might not speak, but they speak in a different way and their relationship to the people on stage has to be as nuanced as a conversation. So if an animal uh, offers, not offers something, but uh, physically offers a, a gesture and the person responds, then the next moment has to be different because it's an exchange. And that has to be written in through either action or language. So Wonderful. it's a complicated thing, but there, there, there's space. The script itself is relatively short because actually there's space in there for the animals to to relate yeah well let's talk complications um there's a pun in there about watches but I, I it's just not clicking for me right now but um can you tell us about some of the more i guess quite frankly difficult aspects of making this adaptation work what's something that you had to leave out that just wasn't that wasn't hitting with the audience i don't know if we left it out i think one of the things we've tried to do is layer a lot of things up. So we have the words that they say in the script, and then there's also sort of the text of the physical action, which is what Lita was talking about, which is like what the puppets do. Of course, the animals don't say stuff, but they have actions, and those actions have to kind of mean something on stage. And then we've got a score, a sound score through a lot of the show. And then we've also got video so that we're constantly transforming the picture. And then we've got automation, which is moving set. We've got lights and sound on top of that. So for what seems quite simple, hopefully, which is like it suddenly starts raining on the ship and the ship lurches from side to side. You know, hopefully when you're watching the show, you go, oh, goodness, the ship is about to sink and it's lurching side to side. But really what that means is you're lining up language and physical action and sound and video and light. So it's a kind of it's a kind of layer cake in a way, some of it that like when it all clicks together, it feels incredibly beautiful and uh, you get transported. But when they're all slightly out, it's really complicated. So I think there's a complication there. One of the, yeah. one oh, of the, thank you. One of the difficulties in the story um, at the end of the book is uh, the magic island. So Pi ends up on this island that is a bit of a, a trip, really, this island that eats people, uh, but is a haven to start with. And uh, when we did it initially in Sheffield, I love the island and I really wanted it in the piece. Um, and everybody, you know, we had the set, we had the whole, we had talking meerkats, we had this whole sort of scene on the island and it didn't work. Um, and, uh, and we found that out quite quickly. And so we had to make a sort of emergency operation and, uh, and the, that whole section was squeezed down into a speech, um, which I wrote hastily on a train on my way between one show and another. Um, and actually it worked, just this speech. But I think all of us have thought, oh, the island, it never worked. So we had another go in, in London um, and, and, and I don't know, sort of um, made it a little bit more. And then we're, we're gonna make more of it here. I think we're, we're, that, that's something that we didn't quite 
manage to fulfill, but I'm hoping we, we manage to do it at ART. Um, I want to just take a moment now to um, uh, remind the audience to, you know, into your own questions into uh, this Q&A. And, um, you know, if you see a question you like to upvote it so we can ask, um, ask our guests. And I think with that, uh, we can actually kind of dive into some audience questions that have started to come in. So this um, question is from, let's see, Jenny Guest. Oh, Jenny, who is a guest? Sorry. <laughs> 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 and she and Jenny wants to know um, what differences uh, you notice between audiences um, in the UK and the US. It's a really good question. Thank you. But I think we have to wait till the show's open to be able to tell you. So can you ask the question again in a month's time? We can give <laughs> really detailed feedback about which yeah. jokes are funnier in the UK and which are funnier in the US. <laughs> well, well, I wonder if there's a way to think about the question too from, from theater in a, in a broader perspective, right? Like how maybe the culture of theater is received here versus versus there. I know this is with respect to one particular um, one particular production, but have you picked anything up in your own experience, you know, professionally in theater? So my first play, Red Velvet, um, uh, opened in London and we went to St. Anne's Warehouse in um, uh, Brooklyn. And it was a very uh, different experience. It's about Ira Aldridge, Red Velvet, a 19th century black American actor who went to England to play Othello in 1833 and was a huge star, but was written out of history. And, um, and so in the play, he is set within British society and you see him operating this black American man. And in England, um, it, was, it was a well-received show, both sides in England and America, but in England, um, he was the outsider because he was American, uh, he was a black American in this white society. And what was interesting when we came to America, which hadn't really occurred to me, was actually everybody else was the outsider and he was the insider because he was the American. And, uh, and so the, the perspective of the show shifted and it made it a more, uh, it, was very, it was really moving in England, but it made it more profound uh, when we were in New York. Um, several people want to know who, who made the puppets? So puppetry takes a long time and a lot of people. So the lead the puppets were designed by Nick Barnes and Finn Caldwell together. And they were made by a really large team of people who came and helped and worked on various amounts of time on the puppets. So that's a, it was a long-term project. It's a workshop worth of people. Uh, Caroline Sorry. Bowman being kind of chief among the makers. So to that point, um, uh, another person is asking, like, uh, if there are auditions that are being held for the puppet makers as well, or is the team already in place? I guess it's like, are you consulting with the puppetry workshop or are you kind of building this team from the from the ground up? So the puppet makers are all the people who've got experience at making puppetry. Uh, it's weird because I think from an outsider, you think a puppet, in my head, it's associated children being a child and making things and crafts but actually a, pup, a really sophisticated puppet's incredibly complicated and it's about balance and levers and a way the paw joint has an elastic in it so it returns at the right speed as you walk so yeah these are all folk who've got experience building puppets and they're kind of amazing with scalpels and paintbrushes and that sort of thing mm, right right uh here's a question for Lolita and and this person wants to know how your experience as a performer influenced, you know, you as a writer? What's the crossover there? Oh, it's a huge crossover. Um, I totally write as an actor, completely. I write from uh, a character's point of view. Uh, and uh, every character is me, actually. So you kind of, I, I play them as I, you know, as they get better, as I, as I, the first draft's always terrible and the second draft isn't that much better, but as it gets better, um, I play them to see what the, what the thought is. For me, the, the most important bit is the bit I don't write. It's the thought between the lines. So if you say one line and then you say the next one, 
what is the thought that takes you there? And that's the bit that has to make sense. Um, and I think that's a very actorly thing to do. So it's intention. And uh, I, I was trained at RADA as an actor and uh, we, we learned Stanislavski was our method. Um, and Stanislavski has seven or eight questions. I can never remember the number, but it's, um, you know, who am I? Where am I? What do I want? Uh, what's in my way? What do I do to get what I want? These sort of questions of character. And that's kind of where I, um, I, I just instinctively start. So it needs to be about people who are aiming for something and at odds at getting that something. And, um, and they have to work out in a very um, logical way, actually. Even if it's illogical, we all work in our own logic um, uh, and they have to work out in, in their logical way how they get where they want to go. So my acting completely informs my writing. So, so that leads into a follow-up question about writing, I think. And that is about the process itself and the timeline that exists between you know, ideation and execution of like the actual act of writing. So the commission comes down, right? It's like, boom, I'm going to adapt Life of Pi. Between that moment where you're like, this is going to happen. And between putting, I don't know, fingers to keyboards, what what's going on? How much are you sitting with your internal, with your internal, you know, thought and idea? Are you just jumping into it from day one? What's that space like? as you're gathering yourself to create? So Red Velvet was my first play. And I learned a lot from that because it took a very long time for me to get to the finished product. And I didn't plan anything. I just wrote. I just had, a, I did all my research. It was hugely researched, but I didn't make a plan. Um, and it took me uh, 30 drafts to get to the play that I'm at now. But I was also a much less experienced writer. So, you know, I don't know which bit falls in which camp. But now, uh, so now that taught me plan, <laughs> always plan, because it, it does, I don't know if it saves time, but it saves pain, uh, because at least you, you, you know where you're going and you, you can think it out before you commit. Um, so I, with, with Life of Pi, I literally took the novel with a highlighter. I know you're not meant to write in books, uh, but I do with this. Um, and I highlighted all the bits that I thought were interesting, were dramatic, were philosophical, was dialogue. I highlighted everything and then I cut and pasted it into a document and put it under lots of headings of God, family, faith, zoo, survival, um, philosophy, uh, religion, you know, different things. And the, and the story of the book is pretty simple. Uh, what I said before, this boy who's happy, goes to sea, tragedy, he survives. So then I put all these different elements into this arc. Um, this is all before I've written anything. And, uh, and then I thought, who do I want to look at in this story? And I was very conscious that um, I if in order to know what this boy has lost, we need to meet them. We need to know who he lost in order to feel it. Uh, and so that's why his family has become very key. So his family and his family friends um, are key in the story um, in order to, so that we can feel their loss. And then once I've sort of panned that out and thought, oh, this bit of Jan Martel's words are really good. That bit of dialogue was good. I really loved the Japanese shipping officials who are quite a sort of minor key in the book at the end. Uh, and I loved the, uh, the international nature of the book. And so for me, they were um, key to telling his story. Uh, so I knew that that was where my focus was. And, and it basically comes down to taste, which is why every writer will tell it differently. So I just was attracted to certain things in the book uh, and I planned all that out and then I started to write. So that would probably have been about maybe nine months to a year of, uh, of research, researching animals, researching Pondicherry, researching the Pacific, you know, sort of, uh, uh, just sort of, I don't know, um, like a, a Venn diagram, different angles of looking at different things. Um, I like how you started to answer the next question that I wanted to ask, and that was about the, the process of research. But before we can really get into that, I would like to, uh, just take a bit of a beat and introduce um, my colleague, Liz Lavoie, who is going to share a special offer for all of you in the audience. So Liz, the floor is now yours. 
Hi everyone, I'm Liz Lavoy from GBH's Member Engagement Department. Thank you all for joining us today at our Beyond the Page event. It's really wonderful to have all of our bookworms and our theater lovers come together for one great conversation. If you're a fan of the Beyond the Page events like tonight's with Lolita and Max, please consider supporting the series and the amazing American Repertory Theater by donating to GBH tonight. When you become a GBH sustainer, you help create a more informed, culturally engaged, and connected world. With your support, GBH will continue to innovate and inspire through programs just like Beyond the Page and more, but we need your help. So tonight, if you are able to give $10 a month as a GBH sustainer, that's just $120 all at once, you will receive a pair of tickets to the theatrical adaptation of The Life of Pi at the American Repertory Theater in Cambridge. It runs from December to late January. It's being called unmissable and extraordinary for its inventive puppetry, its imaginative adaptation, and its captivating storytelling of endurance and hope. Whether you bring a friend, a loved one, or you gift this as a holiday gift in the upcoming season, it's the perfect timing. And it premieres in our own backyard in Cambridge. It's starting off its tour. So tonight, there are three simple ways you can give. You can go to gbh.org slash support events. You can text the keyword GBH to the number 800-204-3811. Or you can scan this QR code right here um, so to pop, pop up the donation form right on your own device. All this information can be found in our chat along with the link, so check that out. It's just really incredible to have all of us here together with Lolita and Max. We're so very grateful. So we hope you can show your support and continue to give what you can to continue a series just like this one. So now we're gonna pass it over. We're gonna see a sneak preview of the Life of Pi theatrical adaptation to give you a little taste of what's coming to the American Repertory Theater this December. Thank you so much, Liz. And um, we can just kind of uh, get back into this uh, with our conversation. Um, if for whatever reason you're just joining us now, um, you know, midway through, we're here for Beyond the Page uh, discussing um, the theatrical adaptation of The Life of Pi with Alina Chakrabarty and Max Webster. This is a conversation just about bringing uh, this book published in 2001 to the stage, and it's going to be making its, uh, you know, premiering uh, the U.S. in Cambridge at the American Repertory Theater next month, and um, hopefully you just got to see that preview. So, Going to just wrap up uh, where we were before we took that break. Olivia, you were talking about some of the research that you were doing. Can you just kind of um, tell us about what that journey was like, being able to consume uh, facts and ideas and, and and stimuli instead of writing, 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 writing? You mentioned stuff about the Indian Ocean. Like, what what's, what kind of research are you doing? Are you going down there? <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> um I guess, it, no, it's more mundane than that. So the book is the Bible, right? So I'm looking at the book and that is my map and, and, and the story I'm going to tell. So um, there's a whole, uh, as I mentioned before, the Japanese shipping officials. So they have come to work out um, how the Simpson, the ship, their ship sank. So I was doing things like looking up um, cargo ships and uh, the family, um, Pai's family, are on the cargo ship with all the animals from the zoo. So I was looking up how likely that was. Um, is that a difficult thing? How do you get from Pondicherry to Manila? And then Manila to, um, I don't think it, they are traveling to Winnipeg, which I think I made up, but I can't remember where the port is that they were going to. I, look, I, I found it out when I was doing it, you know, what, what was the port that they would have come into um, so how far off course was he when he turns up in Tamatlan in Mexico? So it's that kind of logic of um, my geography is terrible. So it's really useful to have a Google and just have a sort of look around and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then I went to London Zoo and I spent an amazing day at London Zoo with one of the keepers who took me around and uh, let me ask really crazy questions. So he found the um, orangutan specialist who was a bit wide-eyed when I said so. Can an orangutan thump a hyena on its head? And, uh, and if it did, what would it take for a hyena to 
bite uh, an orangutan on the throat. <laughs> Uh, so, and, and, and he was very indulgent and went, well, that's an interesting question. Then talked about orangutans and how strong they are and, um, uh, and, and what was possible so that I could um, take the, the personality of an orangutan and put it into my storytelling. So it's things like that. It's sort of slightly random, but it all comes from the book. What are the threads that are thrown up in the book and how do I make them real? Yeah, yeah. Um, just a reminder to everyone um, listening that we're encouraging you to put uh, your own questions into the Q&A and we'll answer them as uh, they come in. And um, if you see one you like, upvote it so we know that's a pressing uh, question that we should put forward. We're going to go back to those questions now with one of those pressing questions. This is from Rebecca who wants to know um, about the, the revision process and looking at this at different points in time. So let's know what are the new discoveries that um, you're making about this particular uh, this particular piece as you're revisiting it now ahead of this Cambridge um, premiere? Well, I think uh, you have to change things each time you have a new group of actors doing something. Um, because, you know, if you try and ask an actor to copy someone else's performance, it's never going to be as good as the person they're copying. It'll always be an imitation. It'll always be somehow secondary. So you, if you're working with a new actor, I think the best, and most creative way to work with them is to ask them to imagine it for themselves and find out what it means for them and is for them. And so that means that the characters are approached freshly and differently and feel different each time you do it. And that's really exciting. We've got an amazing group of actors here in Cambridge. We're really, really Really lucky and they are discovering new things in the text that we've I've lived with for a long time and in the story and they're finding new ways of saying lines and new ways of telling the story and that's really exciting and beautiful and of course some of it stays the same because that's kind of there in Lita's writing and that's clearly like the best way to do a particular thing but a lot of it changes and transforms and develops and hopefully each time we do it it gets a bit richer a bit more complicated a bit more nuanced uh, a bit more exciting so, so there's actually another question um, in the chat that kind of, you know, just brushes against what you said on a nice, you know, on a nice tangent. And that has to do with those new actors. Um, do you think some scenes are going to be different because they're working with new, ads, uh, with new actors in that way? Well, it's hard to say because it's in some ways it's the same because it's the same language and it's the same story and the kind of big story beats that Alita's structured are the same. But each human wonderfully is different and has a different energy. And uh, that's a brilliant thing. And that therefore the scenes will have a different energy to them each time a different set of humans perform them. And that's really great and to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. um, another questionnaire is pointing out that in the book and in the movie, uh, the fear that turns to love that Pi has for uh, the tiger. It's so strongly represented. And uh, this person wants to know if it's difficult to show that emotion coming through with, with puppets, with a, with a mechanical and, you know, non-digital uh, aspect of production. Yeah, it's difficult, but it's the same. It's difficult for an actor too, in some ways as well. So it's, the same thing, it's making sure that what you see, what the audience receives is really clear and uh, you understand what the situation is. And the situation is so uh, visceral and intense. It's a young person in a lifeboat with a tiger that I think we're all really on board with what that situation is. And that what we do in rehearsals is moment by moment, beat by beat, trying to make that story as uh, understandable and comprehensible as possible. And so, yeah, I think it's amazing. One of the things that people are really excited and surprised by is that, you know, something that's inanimate, a puppet can show and express a huge wide range of emotions in the situation. Mm -hmm. I think also it's a real collusion with, it's collusion the right word or a collaboration with the audience. <laughs> and it's, it's that, uh, uh, what Max was saying about, you know, you need the audience to believe in what we're doing. And part of what makes an audience believe is logic. So if the audience under, thinks that the logic makes sense, they'll go with the story. And so then you know that when the jeopardy is set up in the scene, um, you go with it. And one of the things that Jan Martel told us was don't make the animals um, easy. They're dangerous, they're really dangerous. And he kept saying they're dangerous. Don't make it, don't make them be, let them be stroked or, or be sort of uh, softened that 
the people are in a dangerous situation with wild animals. Um, and that was a really good note for us all, actually, wasn't it? In the room, we just yeah. had to keep reminding ourselves because it upped the jeopardy in the writing, in the direction, in the storytelling, in the puppetry, everything. Um, and if the logic is there and the audience go with us, um, then hopefully you will feel, you, you'll believe the stakes that we're putting on stage, which are high in terms of danger. And there is love, yeah, there's a lot of love in it. Mm -hmm. but to that point, can you, uh elaborate on what Martel's reaction to the uh, theatrical adaptation was? He was very trusting, actually. The first time I met him, um, he said, do whatever you want with it, which is extraordinary, right? This book that has sold, I don't know, 15 million copies and this Oscar-winning movie, and you think, gosh, you don't know me at all. And you're just saying, do what you want with it. Um, but he was, he was great actually, because he gave us notes, didn't he? He gave us notes on the script, notes on the story, um, you know, quite kind of, um, yeah, we asked for his feedback and he gave us the notes, but he also trusted that we would, uh, when we argued back or sort of, when I'd say, well, the reason I'm not gonna change that is this, he'd go, okay, fine. Um, yeah. But he did keep us on track with the story, I think. He was very kind and very helpful, I think. Um, and he gave us both some really clear pointers as to what sort of the big objective of certain sections of the book was, like his and understanding some of the logic of his thought process was really helpful for me in working out how to stage it. So one of the things he said to me that was really helpful was that he was, even though it's a fantastical story, he was completely logical about every inch of it. So he worked out how many how many liters of water could fit in a box? How long could you drink it and survive? And then what would happen uh, to your digestive system if you'd only eaten fish for three days? At what point would your skin start to peel? And like the logic with which he approached this fantasy story was absolutely relentlessly scientific. And so I think one of the amazing things about the novel is that it's a kind of hyper-realistic fantasy in some ways. Um, and the two things go together. And I think that was really helpful. And that is what a version of what Lolita was saying about when you think that each building block is believable, then the audience can kind of go with it. Um, I think also it was one of Jan's first times being around theatre. And so when he hung out with us, when we were in workshop stage, he saw us moving coat hangers and cardboard boxes around because, you know, that's how you try ideas without spending lots of money on it, which is really sensible because, you know, once you start building stuff, you know, it costs, it costs. And I think he hadn't quite made the jump that we weren't going to do the show with coat hangers and cardboard boxes. And so when he came to see it and there was projection and waves and very kind of realistic, beautiful, fully realized puppets. He was wonderfully surprised that we'd sort of upgraded from our workshop DIY stuff to this kind of technicolor theatrical effects. Um, and yeah, I think it's been his favorite adaptation of the novel so far, which was great. Um, I feel sometimes creators, artists, you know, they, we, I'm not on either of your levels at all. I want to make that explicitly clear. Um, when some, when you make something, what, sometimes you feel a certain attachment to a sentence, to a character, to, you know, a riff, you know, to a lick. And you just feel a certain warmth and a certain maybe sense of artistic pride that you were able to, to make that, that that came from you. And so I wanted to know this production, if there is a particular moment or aspect of this adaptation that is incredibly dear to you, even if it is just a fleeting moment um, that maybe the audience can't even pick up on. Oh, <laughs> there's so many moments. Um, that's hard to answer. You got an answer, Max? No, I don't know. I mean, I think one of the amazing things the Lita's done has transformed Jan's novelistic prose into actable language, so that the licks of the novel, which are quite kind of baroque and dense and wordy, somehow in the Lita's writing keep some of the same words and a lot of the same essence, but become things that feel sit right in an actor's mouth and sound like things that people say to each other on stage rather than things people write. Um, no, I don't know. I have lots of, sort of secret moments I enjoy on stage, but I'm sure they're kind of rather weird particular bits that always go well or not. Do, do you I, care? 
<laughs> oh, go ahead. Sorry, James, you go ahead. You I was going to ask if you care to share one of those weird particular bits. I always really enjoy a physical sequence when the sailors are trying to work out where to throw Pi off the side of the ship and his mum gets hit by a zebra. And it's a very complicated but very fast sequence where his mum gets hit by a zebra, he runs towards his mum, the sailors realise the left-hand side of the ship is going down, so they carry him over to the other side of the stage. They realise that the lifeboats are full, so they carry him down to the front of the stage and then nearly throw him in the audience. And the whole thing lasts about five seconds, but it's kind of a ballet of sailors throwing pie around, and then they end up kind of throwing him into the audience. And it's a moment where everything gets sort of faster and faster and faster, and then suddenly he's flying off the edge of the ship. And that's always a moment that I enjoy when I watch the show, when it works. <laughs> um, Melita, you were saying you were saying something. Um, can you? Yeah, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say, I mean, I've obviously seen the show a lot um, in various forms. And I'm still uh, when I and, and you know, I go to take notes so that I can give actors feedback and uh, all of that. But I'm still um, filled with um, I get carried away in it sometimes. Uh, and I, I, I get filled with the wonder of the beauty of it because it is a gorgeous piece of work. I mean, Max has put together this extraordinary canvas of uh, sensory events. There's the story and then there's all this beautiful stuff and I get carried away with it sometimes and moved, which is it really, I mean, I know it so well, but it's really lovely to still experience it. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a question from the audience, uh, and that has to go back to the, the movie versus the theatrical adaptation. Um, I was, I'll read it verbatim. Again, since many of us have seen the movie version, what did you want us to take away from the live theater experience as opposed to the film? That was my clarification. I would say this is uh, nothing like the film. Uh, I, I work completely from the book. And the film is a beautiful piece of work, but it's a very different medium. And um, I guess in a film, if uh, Jan, again, had a fabulous description of the difference of, uh, he said that if you write that Pi is at a table, in a book, you go, okay, Pi is at a table. In a film, they're all going, well, what kind of table is it? Is it a coffee table, a dining table? Is it oak, is it mahogany? Is it, you know, what, what kind, is it a plastic table? And in the theatre, um, you don't really need a table. You can just sit him on a chair and he can pretend that he's at a table. Because, uh, and, and I love that because actually that, I don't know how, what, what that means, but it gives you a flavour of all the three different arts. And um, the theatre, this is, this is, this is a, a, a sort of, it's a bit of a, no, it's not a thriller. What is it? The play is, is a story about a family, a boy in a family, and it takes you from his loving home to traveling to immigration to another country far away, to devastation and losing everything, uh, and to survival of sorts and who he is afterwards. And um, the film didn't give me that. The film gave me an amazing canvas and beautiful pictures and I understood where he was and what was happening. But I'm hoping, I mean, I don't know, I'm the writer, so I'm biased. I'm hoping that you'll feel really moved by the play in, in many different ways. Mm. Um, you know, earlier on in the conversation, you were talking about working from the book as the Bible. You had your highlighter, you were writing in the book, you were writing <laughs> passages that fit into family and spirituality and temporality and all of these different, you know, uh, thematic, uh, I guess boxes might be the word that you can operate in. And so I was gonna, I wanted you to kind of get more into that, but there's a question that I think speaks to that quite well. And, um, you know, that is working with those themes, these profound themes of this production. Was there anything of this process uh, that made either of you think differently about your own lives or that changed your worldviews? Hmm. Well, I, I grew up, my parents are Hindu um, and I and my mum was uh, quite, when, when she was alive, practiced. And my dad is 
spiritually a Hindu, but doesn't practice so much. And I'm kind of nothing. Uh, and I went to Catholic school, secondary school, uh, and, and I railed against Catholicism. I was the, you know, I was the, uh, used to annoy the nuns terribly because I'd go, well, why is Christianity so important? Why don't we look at other religions? Um, and I, I kind of realized that, oh, I'm sort of a bit of a pie, really, because actually I, I haven't settled on a religion either. I think there's absolutely a God. And then I, I like the nice bits of all religions. And I hadn't really um, put myself in that position before. So I guess it's clarified things that I um, think anyway, and that I think are probably quite universal, that people are questioning faith and philosophy and their place in the world and their, uh, why are they here? You know, the, the endless questions. Um, so I guess it's clarified things rather than given me a new worldview. Max, do you, do you have anything um, to add to that? Yeah, I guess I've always been quite uh, interested and confused and engaged with religion and not quite sure what I think for a long time. Um, and I think probably my life went from being quite a Christian teenager to then doing more theatre. And that in a sense, making art has probably taken the place of religious practice in my life in some ways. Um, and I think what I've, I think what Pi has helped me articulate is that uh, in some ways, I think for me, the story increasingly becomes about a story about imagination and that there are two stories in the book and two stories in our play that there's a story that's sort of fantastical and imaginative in a way. And there's a story that is very factual and logical, one story with animals and one story without. And I think what's amazing about our show and the novel is that it's not really biased one way or the other. It says that these two things exist and that maybe they almost coexist, maybe both ways of talking about things, the scientific way and the poetic way are kind of different sides of the same thing rather than necessarily intention. And I really want to believe that's possible as someone who believes in the value and importance of truth and facts and science, but equally thinks you want to hold on to imagination and the possibility of something other and something big and values and meanings and poetry. And so I really love the fact that uh, those two stories sort of tessellate with each other in Life of Pi. And I think I'm very proud that it does that. I'm really pleased about that. And I think that's helped me understanding some of those things. I also think like normally when you work on a show for three or four years, you kind of work out what it's about. And I think with Life of Pi, it's gone the other way. It hasn't got smaller, it's got sort of bigger. Like I know less and less what it's about as the years go by. And I think there's this amazing thing at the center of it that's a bit mysterious and a bit magical, like kind of real mysteries are. Uh, and I think that's really wonderful to get to work with that because it sort of constantly changes what it means to me. And I think lots of us who work on it and that's really beautiful. Yeah, um, there's a couple of questions in uh, in the chat that are curious about the logistics of some of this. Uh, it's coming to Cambridge. There are new actors that you will be working with, but as this goes to other cities, and that is a question I want to ask about um, in a little bit. Uh, will there be different actors at each different venue um, at each uh, city? Are you bringing people with you, actors, technicians? Um, uh from from the uk what's that just a quick kind of so the cast is almost entirely american over here which is fantastic we've got a couple of the amazing london puppeteers who are coming and joining the company and they're slowly sharing their skills and knowledge of the show throughout the company here as well but it's a one american company and it's now this company is going to be in the states and that's brilliant here mm. great um it's still in london the actors are still doing it in london which is amazing <laughs> as well it's on in the west end yeah yeah um, this is a uh, pivot back to, again, the differences in adaptation, um, whether you're looking at the film or looking at the, the, the stage. Uh, and this is about um, the, the impact that visuals have on meaning. And so uh, Annie's asking that a difference between the book and the movie is the strong visuals of the film change the ending because it's so ground in the real. Uh, do you feel the play provides yet a different approach to considering the puzzle of the ending? Uh, yes, I think so. I'm trying to, I'm trying, I, I watched the film again recently because I didn't, uh, after I 
sort of worked on the adaptation, I, I didn't read the book or watch the film because I just wanted to work on the story as it was. Uh, and I watched the film again recently. And at the end, it's revealed quite, um, quite straightforwardly, isn't it? That the, the, the people were on the boat and that's what happened. Um, can you repeat it? Sorry, it's quite late here in London, so I'm getting quite tired. Can you repeat the question, James? <laughs> Of course. It's actually a good cue because we're coming up on time. So this might be our last <laughs> question. Um, but uh, Annie basically was asking, and I think I've lost the, the question, the wording itself, but the general overview was um, do the visuals of the visuals of the film yeah. impact the ending of the film more so than the book, perhaps, um, because it, the, the movie is so grounded in the real, you know, Max, you were talking about the, the, the beautiful, you know, CGI that Engel was able to use to make that adaptation. And so what Annie's asking is if the, the, the stage adaptation is providing another approach to considering the puzzle of the ending. I'm going to leave that to you, Max. I feel like my brain's freezing up on that. No, well, I'm going to say that Lolita, does, Lolita, Lolita did it for us because what she does in her adaptation is shifts the way the writing works. So the story with the animals is told in a different theatrical form to the second story uh, in your adaptation, which I think is brilliant. So we have a sort of new style of theatre to do the second story in. Um, I think in the film, the second story doesn't land as well, partly because the visuals of the tiger and the boat are so impressive, but also because it's not really given very much stage time. My memory is it's just one long close-up shot on Pai's face. And I think you sort of hear the words, but you don't get a real sense of what that story might be emotionally. And I think what uh, Lita has done is given enough space to the second story for it to be, it's shorter, but it kind of lands emotionally in a way. So I think you really understand what happens. and so. Yeah, I think it's quite a different experience. Okay, I, I just want to throw in one final question that's a pretty straightforward one, I think, um, just for those that are curious about audience. And that's just, if you think that this um, uh, story, this adaptation is too frightening for young children, and if there's a particular age at which this is appropriate, someone clearly is thinking about this in the context of a, of a gift <laughs> or an outing. I think our guidance in London has been 10 years and up. Uh, I think it might be a little bit older at ART. I think it was um, maybe 12 years and up. But I think that, I mean, we've had very young children come and see it. Uh, uh, so it depends how um, sort of sturdy your child is. If they're a strong eight year old and they like jeopardy and adventure, they'll be fine because there's nothing bad in it. Um, but it is, um, there are animals eating animals, there is death and loss, uh, you know, so, so that's all represented on stage. But I, I think sort of 10 year old and up is, is great. And then if your kid is brave, then they would be fine. I think the worst thing is that the tiger eats a zebra and you see a bit of the inside of a zebra. So that's what they've got to be okay with. And the tiger is quite scary. It prowls around quite menacingly. And the inside of the zebra is sort of rubber, red stuff. So it's not, you know, what you would imagine. Mm. So no glitter, wow. Um, <laughs> well, I think that concludes the questions. I think that concludes the event. Um, Lulu Chakrabarty and Max Webster, everybody, thank you so much. We hope you had an amazing time. Um, and uh, beyond the page, we'll be taking a holiday break for December but you can register now for a January event by following the link and the chat. Um, and don't forget, Life of Pi is coming to the American Repertory Theater this December, and you can get your tickets now at AmericanRepertoryTheater.org. Thank you. Thank you all. And please have a good and a safe autumn evening.